Hello and welcome. I'm Fernando, a GP in the UK. Today, we're going to go through the guidance on hypercalcemia produced by the Maidstone and Tunbridge Wells NHS Trust, as well as other general guidance on the subject, always focusing on what is relevant in primary care only. The links to the information consulted can be found in the episode description. Right, let's not waste any more time, so let's jump into it. Before we start, let's quickly have an overview of calcium metabolism. Calcium is one of the most abundant electrolytes in the body and levels are tightly controlled by parathyroid hormone and vitamin D. Serum calcium is bound to albumin and measurements should be adjusted for it, so we should be primarily concerned about corrected calcium levels. Calcium is mostly absorbed in the small intestine and active vitamin D or calcitriol enhances calcium absorption. Parathyroid hormone, or PTH, is also important. When blood calcium levels drop, PTH is secreted, which enhances calcium reabsorption in the kidneys and also stimulates osteoclasts in the bones, breaking down bone tissue and releasing calcium into the bloodstream. This is precisely the opposite effect of calcitonin, which inhibits osteoclasts and reduces bone resorption and calcium levels. So, from a pathophysiological perspective, a high calcium or hypercalcemia can be seen in, for example, hyperparathyroidism, malignancy or excessive vitamin D intake. There are also pathophysiological interactions between calcium and levels of phosphate and magnesium. For example, a high calcium can suppress magnesium renal absorption leading to hypomagnesemia. Equally, a high calcium also often leads to a low phosphate due to its effect on PTH. So it is important to check these electrolytes when calcium imbalance is found. Right, having had this overview, let's now have a look at hypercalcemia itself. It is generally defined as a corrected calcium level greater than 2.6 on two occasions although we will need to take into account our local path lab reference range. About 90% of cases are due to either primary hyperparathyroidism or malignancy. Other rarer causes of hypercalcemia include chronogranulomatous diseases like sarcoidosis or pulmonary TB, Paget's disease with bed rest, immobilization, vitamin A and or vitamin D toxicity, drugs like thiazide diuretics and lithium, familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, non-parathyroid endocrine diseases, for example, thyrotoxicosis, Addison's disease and pheochromocytoma, milk alkali syndrome, chronic kidney disease, and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. By the way, if you want to know more about tertiary hyperparathyroidism, stay until the end because I will give you a brief pathophysiological explanation of it. The possible signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia are often summarized by stones, bones, thrones, abdominal groans and psychiatric overtones. Let's see where these come from. Stones refer to kidney stones. Bones refer to skeletal symptoms such as bone pain, osteoporosis and fractures associated with underlying bone disorders like in hyperparathyroidism or pathological fractures in malignancy. Thrones refer to polyuria and constipation. Abdominal groans refer to gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, anorexia, weight loss, abdominal pain, pancreatitis and peptic ulcer. By the way, peptic ulcers can be an effect of increased gastric acid secretion caused by hypercalcemia. Psychiatric overtones refer to effects on the central nervous system, such as lethargy, fatigue, depression, confusion, irritability, memory loss, psychosis, ataxia, delirium and coma. Obviously, the list of symptoms is not exhaustive. There are others not included, such as flushing, itching and cardiovascular complications like hypertension, cardiac conduction abnormalities and arrhythmias. In general, hypercalcemia can be classified as mild if corrected calcium levels are between 2.6 and 3, 
It is often asymptomatic and does not usually require urgent correction. Moderate if between 3 and 3.4, and it may be well tolerated if it has risen slowly, but it may also be symptomatic and require prompt treatment. And severe if it is more than 3.4, which requires urgent correction due to the risk of dysrhythmia and coma. The most common cause of severe hypercalcemia is malignancy. What initial investigation should we consider in primary care for a patient with a high corrected calcium? And I'm obviously referring to mild hypercalcemia, given that the more severe cases we will be referring to secondary care for immediate management. So, as investigations, we should organise blood tests in order to check a full blood count, renal function tests, as hypercalcemia can cause renal impairment, sodium and potassium to assess for electrolyte imbalances that may coexist, to check a repeat corrected calcium to ensure that it is not a lab error, also to check phosphate levels and alkaline phosphatase, which may suggest bone involvement, such as malignancy or Paget's disease. Also to test for vitamin D levels to assess for vitamin D intoxication or deficiency. To check magnesium levels, as magnesium abnormalities, usually hypomagnesemia, can also be associated to hypercalcemia. To measure PTH, to determine whether the hypercalcemia is PTH-dependent or PTH-independent. For example, a low PTH in the context of hypercalcemia suggests a non-PTH-mediated cause, such as malignancy, excess vitamin D, granulomatous disease or drug-induced causes. On the other hand, a high or normal PTH in the context of hypercalcemia suggests primary or tertiary hyperparathyroidism or familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. Please note that familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia has an inappropriately normal or elevated PTH because the calcium-sensing receptors in the parathyroid glands are less sensitive due to genetic reasons. The blood test is also to check thyroid function tests, given that hyperthyroidism can also cause hypercalcemia. And we should also check serum protein electrophoresis if multiple myeloma is suspected. We should consider additional tests depending on the clinical context, such as a chest X-ray to screen for granulomatous disease, TB or malignancy, an ECG to look for short and QT intervals or other conduction abnormalities, a 24-hour urinary calcium excretion if we need to differentiate between primary hyperparathyroidism and familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, which has a low urinary calcium, and a cortisol if Addison's disease is suspected. In terms of treatment, we should get specialist advice and treat the underlying cause. We should consider immediate referral or same-day hospital admission in cases of severe hypercalcemia, that is, with a corrected calcium more than 3.4. We should also do so, regardless of the level of hypercalcemia, for symptomatic patients, if there is a suspicion of a serious underlying condition, such as malignancy or a parathyroid crisis, or if there is worsening renal function. Non-urgent outpatient referral would be reserved for patients with mild hypercalcemia, that is, a corrected calcium less than 3, as long as they are asymptomatic and otherwise stable. We should carefully monitor calcium, renal function and other relevant tests while waiting secondary care input. And finally, what do we do with patients with moderate hypercalcemia? Well, from a primary care perspective, the management of patients with moderate hypercalcemia, that is, levels between 3 and 3.4, is controversial. But in general, it may also be safer to err on the side of caution, and many guidelines recommend immediate hospital treatment in these cases too. Other obvious measures that we should instigate in primary care would be to stop drugs associated with hypercalcemia, such as thalasside diuretics, encourage hydration, and if possible, 
avoid immobilization. I will not indulge in secondary care management as this is outside our hands. But one of the limitations is that there are no national guidelines for the management of hypercalcemia and practice varies widely across UK hospitals. The acute management in secondary care generally involves rehydration and then assess if IV bisphosphonates such as pamidronate or zolindronic acid are required, followed by the definitive treatment of the underlying cause, like, for example, parathyroidectomy in primary hyperparathyroidism. Now, as promised, I'm going to tell you more about tertiary hyperparathyroidism. And before I can explain tertiary hyperparathyroidism, we probably need to go through the definitions of primary and secondary hyperparathyroidism first. Primary hyperparathyroidism is when the parathyroid glands produce excessive amounts of parathyroid hormone, or PTH, without any external trigger. That is, it is an intrinsic problem within the parathyroid glands, and the most common cause is a benign tumour or adenoma. In secondary hyperparathyroidism, the parathyroid glands overproduce PTH as a compensatory response to low calcium levels in the blood, and it is the body's attempt to normalize calcium levels. Possible causes of secondary hyperparathyroidism are chronic kidney disease and vitamin D deficiency. And finally, tertiary hyperparathyroidism involves the autonomous overproduction of PTH due to hyperplastic parathyroid glands that no longer respond to normal regulatory feedback, generally seen after prolonged secondary hyperparathyroidism in patients with CKD. Let's quickly examine the pathophysiology of tertiary hyperparathyroidism. In CKD, the kidneys lose their ability to excrete phosphate, leading to hyperphosphatemia. In CKD, the kidneys also produce less active vitamin D, resulting in decreased calcium absorption and hypocalcemia. Both hypocalcemia and hypersosatemia stimulate the parathyroid glands to produce more PTH to maintain calcium levels. This is the secondary hyperparathyroidism stage. However, over time, the continuous stimulation of the parathyroid glands leads to glandular hyperplasia and as hyperplasia progresses, the parathyroid glands become less responsive to normal feedback mechanisms. So, in some patients, particularly in those after prolonged and severe secondary hyperparathyroidism, the parathyroid glands can become autonomous, meaning they secrete PTH independently of blood calcium levels. At this stage, even when the initial cause of secondary hyperparathyroidism is corrected, for example, after a kidney transplant, the overactive parathyroid glands continue to produce excessive PTH, which will lead to hypercalcemia. This is when we talk about tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So that is it, a quick review of the different types of hyperparathyroidism. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember that this is not medical advice, and it is only my summary and my interpretation of the guidelines. You must always use your clinical judgment. Thank you for watching. And goodbye.